welcome to the show. Thanks. Thank you for coming really by. Really honored here. to be here. Johnny and I are excited because we feel like there's a lot going on in the digital marketing space. There's a lot going on in the political space. Sure. And the overlap, I think a lot of our listeners are going to be surprised to see how it plays into personal relationships yeah. and how important relationship building is in each of those endeavors. So the first thing is we're seeing more and more outsiders in politics mm -hmm. <laughs> and candidates who before you never would have imagined would one run and two win. And one of the things that really stands out is their ability to grab the voters attention and start building that relationship with them, start building that trust. And I'd love to hear from your perspective what you advise candidates on to build that relationship, start building the trust with potential voters. So I think it's very clear uh, if your audience doesn't already know it, if you guys talk about it enough, but we are probably in the most disruptive moment in human history. People don't know. We're, I mean, uh, Peter Diamandis, who's a friend of mine, has this great PowerPoint slide he puts together. And in the slide, he shows a city, the city street in New York in 1900, and it's all horse and carriage. And then in 1913, same city street, it's all car, right? We are in that moment right now. And so when people talk about whether it's social relationships, business relationships, or even politics, everything is being disrupted. And we saw that with the presidential race in 16. We saw that with this congressional race in New York um, with Cortez winning, who's a socialist, right? And, and that's what we're talking about. I actually tweeted to her a few months ago after she won and I, because I read her story. I didn't read her politics. I'm not here to talk right. about that. I read her story and her story was amazing. She literally went through like four pairs of sneakers. She knocked on every single door in the district and she got to know on a personal level, the voters. And if there's anything we're gonna take away today, it is that this is the outlier strategy that nobody's talking about anymore. <laughs> yeah. Right? Because uh, it's hard work. I, I, yeah. for, yes. People can't see me. I'm holding my phone in front of my face. That's what everybody does. So if you can figure out a way to do it the opposite, and I'll walk into the, all those uh, strategies and how it looks, but that is the key to everything this day, whether it's successful relationships or it's being successful in marketing or being successful in business. And it's hard work. And Cortez, this candidate out of New York, she got, got that. Listen, I always say this, like in California right now, you've got uh, a, a governor's race, you've got a U.S. Senate race right now. And if you're a down ballot candidate, let's say you're running for the state Senate and you want to break through, how do you break through the millions of dollars of ads that are being run right now? Right. It's easy. I tell this to every down ballot candidate I've ever worked with. I, I know how to get you elected. It's not hard. You need to walk every single day voter and knock on every door of every voter in your district four times. You need to call them. You need to write them handwritten notes. You need to get to know them, build a personal relationship. And then you use your marketing as a reinforcement right. of, the, of, of what you've converted. It's, it's convert first, brand second, which a lot of marketers just don't get in this day and age. And so that's what she did. And that's what these non-politicians are getting to communicate in different ways that people aren't going. It, it's crazy. This Listen, God, it's so crazy. This outlier strategy right now is building <laughs> a personal relationship. That's insane to me. Right. We're but, talking about handwritten letters, right? Well, Snail mail. And, you're and, like, and I'll give you a great example of that. So uh, there's a clothing designer out of uh, New York named Billy Reed. And my wife loves his clothes. And so for Christmas, I got her big gift certificate, you know, cause I am not buying her clothes. And that she orders, you know, like a thousand dollars worth of clothes and they ship them to her. And in the box of the clothes that they ship, they have a handwritten note in there that says, we are so grateful for your business. Anything you could, if anything doesn't fit, send it back to us, anything you need, here's our number, call us. She went, I'm a customer for life now yep. because they care about me. And that, I mean, and I'm like, yeah, I mean, we inherently get this in politics because the politician has to connect with the voter. And I always say this to any candidate or politician that we worked with, I, I love you, I'm sure you're great, you know, but I really care about what the <laughs> voter thinks. Right. And in, mar in marketing on business, it's I care about what the customer thinks or the client thinks first. That's my number one concern. And then I wanna try to find alignment whether it's with the candidate or the business in that, in that voter or that customer. Now, obviously we know that name recognition and money play a big role in politics, but if you are that upstart and you don't have either of those advantages, 
what do you really have to work with and how are you getting voters attention, appreciation, and ultimately their acceptance to actually vote for you? Yeah, I think this is what makes political marketers different than corporate marketers because I think a lot of corporate marketers come out to business and they're like, all right, we gotta we gotta have a Facebook uh, strategy. Uh, what's our SEO? And they're let's throw money at it. And they don't understand the customer first. Like, what did they care about before you go spend all this money? In politics, it's the same way. A candidate starts at zero. It's like the ultimate startup company, right? It starts at zero. It's got to raise money throughout the campaign. By the way, that campaign that that where we've got to raise millions of dollars typically lasts like nine to fifteen months. That's it. And like, so it's if you really think it's totally fucking insane. It's nine months where you raise, 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 spin, 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 and then you're you have to finish at zero, or you're negligent to your client. But in the first part of a political campaign, we don't spend any money. Right, we go out and talk to voters. We we test things like if we're you know we need to start. We're running social media campaigns. Maybe we have a small budget, but we use that small, very very microscopic budget to test certain concepts, to test out what they care about, to test what the voters are thinking. Listen, I've never gone to a politician and said you need to believe you need to believe what the what the voter thinks. But a politician uh, you know, can take a very, uh, an issue that they believe in, they wanna talk about, it's really important to them, but the voter doesn't give a shit. And so I tell the politician, don't, don't talk about that. Or it's a very divisive issue, don't, don't do that. Find where you have alignment, two or three issues where you have alignment, and then go to town on those issues. And that's what I tell the same thing with a, with a business. Uh, when we market for businesses, you just can't believe how many times businesses will talk about stuff that no one gives a damn about. Mm, right. And or people that are out socially, they'll talk about themselves the whole time, or they'll talk about things that people don't give a shit about that they're talking you know, to the other person to. And so that's the point is, how do you find alignment, and then how do you dri drive your strategy uh, to ultimately convert that person. And it feels like in politics, obviously you have this deadline that's looming, right? The day of the vote, which is in business, a lot of times you don't have those deadlines. Maybe it's a product launching or maybe it's a new brand, but for the most part, from a marketing standpoint, we're just trying to get more eyeballs on a rolling basis, try to get more people through our funnels. Do you notice a difference in the way that politicians utilize that deadline more effectively than businesses? Yeah, we cut the bureaucracy out. And we have the ultimate deadline, right? Election day, right. and that creates speed. And so, <laughs> when, when I go work with businesses, they literally like slow, they tell me to slow down, and I'm like, "What do you mean slow down? Like this is your business." Yeah. And and we use language like we need to go win, and these businesses are like, "Well, hold on, we need uh, the brand management and the brand structure." I don't give a shit right. about that stuff. What I care about is like, let's go win. What is your outcome? What are you trying to achieve? And we understand that in working in politics because we. We have this deadline you know if we do not like here's the thing in my business and I would say it's, I call it the three R's and I think it applies to everything in life right it's reputational it's re re relational and it's referral and in the the business of political marketing don't don't take the politics out of it the business of political marketing that's the only way I get business right I've never run an ad in my life and gotten a client ever I run it because my reputation is we win, and if we don't win political races, I'm out of business because everybody knows whether I win or lose. My All of my competitors know what uh, you know, political campaigns we're working on, and they'll cut my throat if we lose. They'll savage me in pitches in the future because they'll say, that guy lost, right? And everybody loses, but right. you gotta win more than you you know lose. And then you know your relationships, the relationships you build with other people. And then obviously those two things help with referrals. And so if you're if you run a business or what, but if you could if you think about this, if your entire company was based on referrals or optimizing current clients to build your business out, how differently would you look at your company or your business? And so we we have to do that in politics. I typically don't make a lot of money on the political campaign I'm working on. It's only after we've had success and we've won for that politician do we get paid, whether that's in bonuses, whether that's in, you know, we submit for bigger like awards, or creative awards for ads or anything like that. And it's all because we have to put the client first and once they win, we reap the rewards after that. And that's just the way it should be. And so when I wrote the book, it was kind of like, I didn't see that in the marketing place. Right. All these marketers make money before businesses make money. And I just said, well, we don't do that in politics because we're relational, reputational, and referral. 
And so I just sort of decided to like re-engineer that and lay it all out and, and so how, how business owners could win. And I think for us here, we've been preaching this for 12 years now with the technology advancements, the right. disruption that we talked about, our lives are changing. Careers are not the same anymore. You're gonna be asked to learn new skills, try new things, challenge yourself. So those three R's are valuable personally. We're talking about building a personal brand on reputation, making sure that you deliver, and also, by the way, hey, most jobs are found through your network. So if you're not making relationships, you're not gonna get those referrals that actually lead to that next gig if your company implodes, your startup doesn't go anywhere. So. On a personal level, obviously, you're the master of branding. What do you see most of us are doing wrong in our online branding and the oh, way that we approach this? Jesus Christ, how long do we have? <laughs> Not enough time, uh, right? The one thing I see, I met with a business owner this morning, uh, it's a client, and he's like, yeah, I have an SEO guy, and I have a Facebook guy, and I'm like, but what's the strategy? And he's like, oh, I didn't think about that. And so what people aren't getting is, and, and again, let me, make the parallel with politics. The first thing I do in a political campaign is I say, we gotta understand the voter, right? And so we run out and we do research on all the voters in the district or the state or wherever, right? And we find out what are the high issue, high point issues, where is their congruency with the candidate? We find out everything we, we need to know about them. That's the whole key to what we're doing. 99% of the business owners outside of the Fortune 500, but even like 75% of the Fortune 500s don't even do this. They don't start with the research. And so you've got to go out and run and figure out everything you need to know about your clients or your, or your customers. I can figure that out first. What do they care about? How do they see your business? What do they? I'll give you a great example. Uh, we have a client that we're working with and they, I'm not going to say what industry it is, but they have thousands of customers. And they've been running ads for years and they've stalled in their business. They grew, had a real high growth, all of a sudden they stalled for like four years. And they were like, they came to us and they're like, I can't figure this out. And, and I said, well, what are, you, what are you doing in your marketing? Well, we're offering discounts for everything, right? And you know, it used to work, it's not working anymore. Right. It kind of goes back to the way the world's changing. And so I said, well, let, let's go in and figure this thing out. So we ran this whole data uh, audience insight report. It was huge, like a hundred page report. And we found out that the customer cared about quality. <laughs> They'd been running a marketing effort, spending yeah. literally 80 grand a month on discounts. That's not what the customer wants. That doesn't mean you can't offer discounts, but you have to offer, they want, to, they like quality. So we went in there, you know, it doesn't cost the business anything. We went in there, changed all their scripts, changed the, uh, their uniforms. We changed everything. Everything's about quality. Now, do we also, also offer like referral discounts and things like that? Of course you do. Right. But that's just a tactic. The strategy is quality. And then how do you intercede that into everything you're doing? And that's what you gotta do. And so I think businesses miss the point of understanding their customers first. I would be out of business in politics if I said, you go talk about anything you want. Now, there is one you know, politician that's done that successfully, but 99% of them have not. Right, and we're also talking about someone who's built such name recognition. Right. That, that could do that. Right, right, that he could cut through that noise, but most of us are not there, whether right. it's personally, politically, or even in a business, we're competing for everyone's attention. That's right. And to use your analogy earlier, you look at that same street corner in New York, and now we're bombarded with ads and billboards and flashing lights, and oh, we also have this mobile ad <laughs> machine in our phones that's constantly fighting for our attention. So in all of this noise, how do we stand out as someone that people should pay attention to? Well, again, I, I go back to this, and I, I'll just, this is gonna be a recurring thing. First of all, it's one of the, the lies in the book. You see, I think a lot of business owners see these built like look where we are right now. There's you know billboards all over the place right, right off Sunset Boulevard, right? And so they see this and they go, oh, I need to brand my business before I convert the customer. And that works for big companies. I don't have a problem with that. But ninety nine percent of small businesses, and I'd say a hundred million or less, you know, they have to convert first and brand right. second in, in politics. So, in po listen, I think it's infinitely harder to convert someone to vote for an unknown or unsavory candidate than it is to get someone to buy a tube of toothpaste, right? So I have to go do everything I can to have the candidate build personal relationships and convert a voter. And once we know that voter is converted, 
then we reinforce with branding. We reinforce with the digital marketing. We reinforce with whatever traditional marketing we need to do. But it all goes back to the fact that you have to build a personal relationship. If the customer sees you as a commodity, you will be out of business with that customer soon enough. Right. So in, in great example, Tony Shea. Zappos. Yep. He built a billion dollar company that sold to Amazon on one premise, build personal relationships with the customers. Their call, you know about their call centers? Their call center has a 9% turnover rate. The average turnover rate for a call center in this country is 150%. Right. They, they don't use anybody overseas. They don't automate. They don't put rules like you need to be off in two minutes or they don't prioritize who calls because they're a big customer. Everybody is equal in their eyes. And their, their, their operators have one mission build a relationship, yeah. that's it. It and doesn't matter. It starts with valuing their attention in the first place. Right. And a lot of business yeah. owners, a lot of people don't do that. We talk about this a lot on the show, active listening. Business owners aren't doing it. Politicians have their message that they wanna get across. They're not listening as well as they could be. And then you see these upstarts come in who just focus solely on listening and they disrupt the whole thing. That's right. Oh, I, can, I can tell you that I honestly get upset of having to think about calling any of these companies about a product that I have or any issues I'm having because I know that I'm going to be putting the phone on speaker. It's right. going to sit there. And then there's the, 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 you know, here's all your options and everything's automated. It's like, can I just get a human being? That's, I would love to talk to one person really quickly because I have one small question and it's, and I've, I've always noticed that every time that I need to call anybody for anything, the question is not going to be answered in the options, right? I, I need I need a person. Yeah, so, and to your point, with all these billboards and ads, we're we're paying for people's attention. We're not valuing it when we actually get it. Yeah, I'll give you. Can I give you two examples? Yeah. So two airline examples. Uh. -oh. <laughs> <laughs> Am I not supposed to do this? <laughs> no, we, we know the examples. <laughs> no, you don't. Oh. So yesterday I okay. flew American Airlines and they canceled my flight because there weren't enough people on it. So I ended up being delayed by five hours. When I was trying to rebook my flight, I called the number, my you know gold, American Airlines gold member. And they said, uh, you know, we'll call you back within 45 minutes to an hour and a half. Now my flight had been canceled. I never even knew that they did that. Oh yeah, now they have an option that you can press a button and then they'll call you back. But I, I, my flight is canceled. I haven't work. I, I mean, I'm, my God, I'm coming to talk to you guys. Like, I don't put me on. Tell me you'll call me back in 45 minutes to an hour. Have me someone go. This is awful. We're so sorry. I know it's not, not your fault, operator. All right. Well, let's fix this. Like that, that's what I want. Right. They're not listening. The other one is Southwest Airlines, which I don't, I love Southwest, but you know that there was a cut a, a, a person on their plane a few months ago who got almost sucked out of the plane. <laughs> yes. You, yes, and she passed away. It was traumatizing to see the headline. How do you get sucked out of an airplane? So the next day, the CEO of Southwest goes on Twitter and does like a live uh, update. Did you see this? No, I did not see okay. the update. Yeah. So he goes, and I'm thinking to myself, Good for him. That was quick. That was a good response. People are concerned about their safety. I was literally flying Southwest the next day, so I was like, Jesus Christ, right, like, what's gonna happen? Yeah, so I'm like, good, that I, that's assuring me, right? And he's on a social platform that people consume news. I'm like, great, that was really smart. And then he gets up, and literally he's standing like at a podium, and he's got a piece of paper, and he goes, today I want to mourn oh. the, and he's reading it! Someone died! Honestly, a customer died. And I this is I write about this the book. Why don't people just go be humans? Right. Go, you know what? One person dying is too many on my flight. I will do whatever it takes to make sure there is no plane that is unsafe and would ever do this again. Understand this, I will fight until the bitter end to say to do anything I can for our customers. Boy, if he had said that. That's, yeah, no paper necessary. You don't need the legalese. Why don't you say that? Because he's like, lawyers are telling me I can't say this and I can't say that. Like, bullshit. Be a human being. And that's what we lack. It's the personal connection. Everybody's on their phone. Everybody's on their tablet. Everybody, Zucks said, you know, we're going to bring everybody together on Facebook. And that's really not what happened. No. And so you can use that platform as a positive, but it has to be authentic relationships. It has to be presence. 
people have to feel empathy and vulnerability from you as a business owner or a partner or you know whatever it is. Yeah, we're talking about building trust. Totally. And the other thing that people don't understand is, you know, I'm not trying to build trust to be friends with you for five minutes. I'm not trying to build trust with you to, to get the one purchase. I'm not trying to build trust with you to get the one vote. I want to build a lifelong trust that leads to deeper relationships, Correct. deep friendship, multiple purchases as a customer, right? right? Just like your wife getting that handwritten note. Well, that's a customer for life who's going to buy a lot of stuff over the course of her lifetime from that brand. But if we're just getting yelled at, and then the second something goes wrong, I gotta wait talking to a robot, and then I get corporate speak, I'm completely turned off. I feel disconnected from the brand. That's right. So Now we're forced into the airlines, but somebody's gonna disrupt this at some point. Well, I, it's amazing to me that no one thought that maybe we should not have him go if he's gonna be reading it, but send a representative or somebody right. who's good at speaking, because that's going to be bad. But they've all been botching it. United, American, oh, Southwest, they're interchangeable. Yeah, totally. It's not like, it <laughs> yeah. wasn't a surprise. ESPN. You it was a year ago, the Charlottesville, you know, race wars happened, right? Yep. And someone passed away. And ESPN, a couple weeks later, do y'all remember this story? ESPN had a college football game in Charlottesville, like a couple weeks after this. So this is a year ago. So it was like a couple mm -hmm. weeks later. Yep. And one of the announcers was a guy named Robert Lee that was gonna call the game for the University of Virginia's football game. Not the Confederate General Robert Lee, right, right, an Asian guy named Robert <laughs> Lee. They pulled him from the broadcast because they said I they didn't this. want to offend anybody. Now, I don't care if you lean left or right or whatever, everybody, there was outrage on both sides. Right, like, it's even more offensive. How stupid. And then <laughs> they, they sat on their hands for like three days. Right. And then the president of ESPN comes out and says, we're sorry that this was even uh, uh, this even made news anyway. And I'm like, you're the one who made it news. Are you crazy? Right. Like, you're the one who caused this. If he would have come out and said, I'm an idiot. Actually, I'm a I made a boneheaded decision. I, I make boneheaded decisions sometimes. This is one of, of those. Moment. I way overthought this. I really apologize. Let's get back to sports. Everybody would have been like. We're good. Right. They've been like, all right, they would have moved on. But we live in this society where people are so afraid to be authentic. They're so afraid of their shadow. Everybody, every business owner I run into is like, did you see what Roseanne said? I'm like, you're not Roseanne. <laughs> be normal. Talk authentically. This is what resonates with customers. And it's the same way with politicians. It happens every time. The reason politicians are so successful is because they, they meet this voter and they give their full presence to that person right. and they have high status, right? And then give that presence and that voter is like, I am all in on this person. Right. He cares about me. Yeah. Oh, wait, hold on. They don't, I don't agree with him on anything. That's fine. That's like, you know, if we look at some of these presidential campaigns, that's why those presidential campaigns were, it's the, you know, who do you want to have a beer with? People want to have a beer with Obama. Sure. Yeah. Like they did not want to have a beer with McCain. Like, I get that. I understand that. So what can we do to pump up our likability if we are John McCain or John Kerry or some of these bumps on a log who maybe don't have the personality? Oh, man. I, first of all, again, I, I, it's, it, you're asking from a very presidential perspective. And let's just say we're going to have a lot of people running in the future. Yeah. And, and I think the window is open for people that don't come from the system. It, it, that, that door has been ripped open. But someone that's probably more careful or, you know, uh, has is a little bit more deft can have an opportunity because they're looked at authentically. I right. think if you come up and you're, you run for mayor and then state house and then congress and then governor and then you decide you want to run for president those people are going to have a harder time unless they redefine themselves and stick out by not always following what their party says they have to do right by actually having a backbone and yeah. being a human and right. or saying this may be somewhat unpopular i'm going to say it anyway People well, respect that, right? When there comes to self-expression, right, then people are able to be attracted to that person. There's something to, to hold on to. There's there's something there. Uh, with everyone just playing it safe to not offend anyone, you, we're turning ourselves into cardboard cutouts. Right. It, it, it's, it's difficult to have a beer or, like, or to feel any movement of an attachment to, so, to anyone. So I have a question for you all. Yeah. So y'all deal with people that want to be coaches, but they have generic crap. Do those guys ever succeed? I mean, from our perspective, the 
the first step of saying I want to be a coach is already saying that you're not ready for that responsibility. <laughs> so we, we get those messages of like, I don't actually need your training. I'm just ready to start teaching yeah. the training. And it's going about it the wrong way. Yeah. We became a coach because people said, wow, the conversations you're having on this podcast are so interesting. I want you to work with me personally. Yeah. It doesn't happen the other way. Totally. If you go in with the goal of being a coach, it's a heck of a lot more difficult than presenting yourself as the expert and then people seek you out for that coaching. And you, you can see the same thing in politics where, you know, people try to check the boxes, but there's really no substance there. So let's dig into that a little bit more from an online perspective, because obviously imagery is important in a campaign situation where you maybe only have a couple touch points with the candidate unless they've actually knocked on your door. So what are you doing digitally to increase that candidate's likability? And are there any emotions that you're really looking to evoke in the potential voters? So we try to create the creative, right? The creative aspect of our ads or, or what, what we're trying to do in a way that resonates. That can be done in a positive way. It can be done in a very negative way. Right. The positive way, uh, there's um, uh, one of our clients is the Lieutenant Governor of Florida. He's Carlos Lopez Cantera. And we, you can't, go build a relationship with 7.9 million voters in Florida, and that's what you need right. to win in the state of Florida. So you try to build that authentic relationship by your creative, like that's what you have to do. And if you're a big business, you can't talk to every customer, you have to figure out, is your creative supplementing that authenticity? Right. And so we did this uh, video with him on, he loves donuts, so he always eats donuts every time he's on the road, he's eating donuts, so it was National Donut Day. So what, and, like, it's not like, um, uh, this is going to sound maybe politically incorrect, but like Veterans Day, every politician will put out a generic, bland statement, you know, honoring the troops that have passed away. And it, that's great. But that doesn't do anything. It's inauthentic in a way. It's like you're just checking a box, right? right. Jay, like mm -hmm. you just said, right? And so we were like, how do we take one of these days, you know, that that people celebrate stupid stuff and then make it authentic. So we did National Donut Day and we did this video and he talks about he's at one, the most he ever ate was like seven donuts at one time. And then he stops, he says, hold on, is my wife gonna see this? And then we got his wife in like a couple days later and we said, did you know that Carlos, on camera, and they said, you know that Carlos ate seven donuts at once in one day? And you could just see this huge eye roll on camera. Now, I'm married. And my wife rolls her eyes at me almost on a daily basis, right? So every woman could relate to that. Every man could relate to that. Absolutely. Uh, you know, we did like a, a donut emoji around his head. I mean, we're just making it fun and, you right. know, and authentic and all that stuff. And that thing went crazy. We had so many articles written about that, that video. Like it went viral because it wasn't we honor the troops on Veterans Day because of all the work. And all that's true, but it doesn't do anything. It doesn't move the needle. It's checking a box. Stop right. checking boxes. That's what we always say. Even hearing that story put a smile on my of face. Like, oh, this guy is a regular American. So let me go to the second one. Negative. Okay. Right. All right. So in politics, you've all seen the negative ads, right? A few. Yes. yes. <laughs> do, do you like them? I. It's Generally. so funny you say that. You know, my gut says no, right. but they also tend to be the ones that I pay more attention to. Sure, but uh, do you like them? Well, no, okay, I don't think okay. anyone likes Let's being bombarded. And why do we use, why do we do it? Well, fear works. Yeah, There's it a great works, motivator. right? Totally agree. So, you know, in politics, we will literally take a club and bat, hit somebody over the head with it. I'm not talking about that in the business world, in the personal world, whatever. But if you can draw a comparison from, especially if you're, an under, if you're an underdog in the marketplace as a business, you can have explosive results through your creative, as you're asking. So I'll give you a couple of examples. And by the way, none of it's offensive. None of it offends anybody. But you are literally taking out your opponent, your competition, whatever. And when we've worked with businesses that have done this, and I'll give you a couple examples, it's been amazing. So the Apple versus PC ads. Do you right. remember those from 10 years ago? Yeah. Yes. Nerdy PC guy, cool, hip, young <laughs> Mac guy. The greatest negative advertising campaign ever run was by Steve Jobs, who did something like, he did 360 60 of these ads. He only ran like 68. Right. It was a strategy. It wasn't a tactic. 
And you know, the, every, on every ad, the PC guy tripped over himself. His glasses were all square and big and nerd. Everything. He dug his own grave. Right. And everybody, you're smiling, AJ. This is what I'm talking I remember about. It was hilarious. Yeah. This is going on in the '80s. It was the Pepsi. Uh, it was the Pepsi taste test. Pepsi challenge versus yep. Coke. Right now, it's going on with McDonald's and Wendy's. Wendy's is punching up. They are that Wendy's. Twitter feed, Twitter account went from 750,000 like two years ago to like over three million or two and a half million now because they are constantly ripping McDonald's in a funny way. Right. R- McDonald's put out a tweet recently that put insert copy here, <laughs> right? Like their stupid marketer forgot yeah. to like, whoops. Yeah, and he, he posted it. <laughs> and Wendy's responded, hey McDonald's, your tweets are broken like your ice cream machine. <laughs> like you're laughing, like no one's offended by that. But it makes your brain go to the negative on McDonald's and it makes you think, wow, Wendy, Wendy's is really fun. I like that. Right. right? T Mobile, John Legere is doing this uh, with Verizon and ATT right now. He's crushing them every chance he gets on customer service. On, you know, they, they got like ATT came out with some update the other day and he's like, this is hilarious. Like, do you know how backwards you are? You're bragging about updates that we've had for like two years now. Like, he's doing this everywhere on them and it's brilliant. And what happens is in politics, this particular, like if, we, if I have a candidate, we run a negative ad, you have about an eight to, uh, I'd say, let me check that back. You have about a five to 14 day window before the, you get punched in the face, right? right? Your competition, they know it's coming because that's all we do. Yeah. So they've either got something holstered that they know it's coming and they can respond immediately or they get caught off guard and then they quickly act and they put something up to respond to it. In the business world, it's six to 12 months before a typical business realizes what's going on and they take an action on it. And usually because they don't understand how sort of the comparison advertising world works, they, they fuck it up. Right. So like Coke in the eighties created new Coke and it almost bankrupted. It almost it was though. a huge mistake. Yeah. That, yeah. Was, that was because All Pepsi those Pepsi ran challenges. the Pepsi challenge, <laughs> right? Uh, Steve Jobs, you know, it's not Steve Jobs, um, uh, uh, who's uh, the, Oh, I can't think of a say, but like Steve Jobs ran the negative ads and oh, Bill Gates like came out with some strategy two years ago and tried to defend themselves in an ad. It looked awful, it looked pathetic. Right. And so my thing is, and by the way, Apple had moved on. The combination of the Mac versus PC and the iPhone all came out at the same time and it gave them explosive, the most explosive growth to become the biggest company in the world. Right. And they also still dominate that one market, which is the younger market. And it all started with those ads. So we have some listener questions here. Okay. Let's dig into the first one, going back to this idea of how we struggle to communicate over technology. And we feel that certainly here on the show that technology is a tool that we're still mastering. Right. As humans, we've only been holding these digital phones for decades now, not centuries. So we're still trying to catch up. We got a question here. We're expected to do so much of our communication via technology these days. I wondered if you guys had any advice on rapport in these situations, how to keep digital communication meaningful. What are your thoughts on building rapport over digital communication? Make it about the other person. Stop making things about yourself. Like for me, building a rapport is tell me about, you know, if I'm catching up with a friend on Facebook Messenger or whatever, like, how's your family? What's going on? Like, I, I and I genuinely care about that. I mean, th- right. let's, there was a point in my life where I didn't feel anything. I had no vulnerability. I had no empathy. I was a mess. And I married a good woman who kind of kicked me in the ass. And I did a lot of work on myself. And I realized that when I started caring more about others first rather than myself, same thing that I preach, whether it's the politician or the business owner, when I cared about the customers or when I cared about how great my product or service is, then those people had ultimately more success. Right. And when I took a step back and said, I, I want to give more of myself to help other people or to care about other people or to understand their perspective, where they come from, whether and whether it be on social media, whether it be through text, or whether it be over coffee or dinner or whatever, I'm infinitely more happy or happier, and I have a lot more substance in my life. I mean, right? Don't right. you feel absolutely? That way? And I feel like the the question number one, uh, we've been huge proponents of fostering rapport in person. Absolutely, that that is where we start. 
because there's so much nuance to your nonverbal communication and being fully present to allow that rapport to actually build. That's why he's here in this room right now. We, right. We would we want to do all these interviews live if possible right. because of, of, of that very thing. Hey, I flew from Florida. You <laughs> did. <laughs> but it was important. Like I that's your mission. Yeah, and I you can't do I, I this digitally. That. If we did right. a video conference, we'd build even less rapport. If, if we were strictly doing audio, it'd be even tougher for us to say, oh, I'm really connected to Phil and vice versa. But when you share a room with someone and you show them that you are completely present, right? We're not on our phones, we're not looking out the window, all that stuff is happening digitally. So I think a lot of times we try to fit rapport into this digital box when maybe we should just take a step back and go, you know what digital is good for? The planning, the coordination. Mm -hmm. Okay, meet me here, we'll grab coffee here. Oh, when's your flight land? Great. And then save the rapport building when you're actually in person and you can be fully present. You know, you know who gets this really wrong? Half the people that try to connect with me on LinkedIn. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's only half for the you. Worst. I think it's 99% Honestly, of people on LinkedIn. They literally like take rapport and they throw it up. Like they, they just go, this is me. I'm yeah, like, I, yeah. I don't even know you. Right. Why are you messaging me? No, no, they want, they want to give me $10,000. <laughs> Perfect. Right. I'll take it. <laughs> so follow up question. How do you not get overwhelmed when everyone is trying to contact you and you're trying to maintain five conversations at once? How to deal with people who like to message you constantly? So he's, he's kind of tripping over himself with technology here. I find in general that being sincere and honest of like, honestly, Facebook Messenger, not the best way to communicate with me. Mm -hmm. If this is important, we need to elevate this to my cell phone. We gotta elevate this to let's meet at lunch. In these situations where you're getting overwhelmed by everyone trying to contact you, it's compartmentalizing them a little bit and saying, okay, you know, I need to move this relationship forward, so let's move to being in a room together. Let's move to a phone call. And then allowing it to put some of these people on the back burner. I feel like everyone has this need to like, I have to maintain every single connection lead that's coming across my inbox. We don't have that kind of time. It's respect for the other people and yourself. Right. And you know, what I tell the guys, that I mean, we have a lot of clients that we worked with for, we've been doing this for close to 12 years now. So there's, I'm constantly getting hit about questions or whatnot. And I tell all the guys, even after for this, these 12 years, it's, it, you know, if you have a question, you, you need me up for anything, hit me up. I have time for everybody. It's just, I have to make time to find when that time is. So I will make the room, I will look for time to be able to speak, but I try not to handle everyone digitally or just uh, off, off kilt just to make sure that it's meaningful, impactful, and engaging. Yeah, Johnny, I'm the same way. Like, I have to carve it out in my schedule. Yeah. I think that that's probably the answer for me. Well, other than the fact that I'm completely ADD, so I can handle <laughs> I can probably handle 30 things juggling at once. But but if I can create a schedule that says, all right, I'll address certain contacts here, you know, and just box put a box in it, right, and then carve out time to respond, and then prioritize the top ones that I need to get to. But I mean, I get that. I have clients that will call me at all hour. I had a client calling me at 5 a.m. this morning. Uh, that is going to be answered at a time where I can give that person my presence and I can be helpful to them, right? Well, if, if I sent out a message to somebody and someone just wrote me back saying, "Yeah, shoot," like, "Well, can we get on the phone? Can we meet? Can <laughs> right. we?" Like, I, I'm reaching out to you because I want uh, you to be in, to this to be impactful and engaging. Because if I'm reaching out, that means I'm in trouble. That means I need help. I need a question answered. Uh, I'm going to be, it's, it's a putting yourself in a vulnerable situation mm -hmm. to get a flip in. Yeah, go ahead, shoot. It's well, also, <laughs> think about it. We, we're so primed to say yes to everything, we end up letting everyone down, and that burns our reputation, as you said. So I would much rather say, no, I can't do this right now. No, I don't have the time for this right now, and be open up front because that actually saves my reputation. But if you say, yes, totally, let's do it, let's jam out, three months later, it doesn't happen then people don't trust your word anymore. Oh, AJ said he was gonna do that, but he didn't follow through. So a lot of times when you're feeling overwhelmed, it's because you're not doing a good job of setting up a boundary of like, I don't have time for this. It's not helping me reach the goals that I've aligned for myself. And I know it's uncomfortable to say no to people, but it's actually very liberating because you just don't have enough time for everyone's wants, needs, desires. 
We had a question here around vulnerability. Um, I asked, sometimes after making myself vulnerable, I leave the conversation feeling let down. Reflecting on these conversations, I can usually trace back that feeling to a couple of emotional bids I made that the other person either didn't respond to or responded negatively to. If that person's a friend, do I just keep making myself vulnerable in the hope of better responses in the future, or do I consign them to the acquaintance ring? What are your thoughts here, Johnny? Well, I, it's something we've mentioned earlier. I think we're all learning uh, on how to deal with all this technology. And we were just talking the other day about the turning away from emotional bids right. and, and how destructive that can be to the other person because they're putting themselves in that vulnerable situation. But I think I said it then and I'll say it again. We have to take that in consideration that 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 everyone's attention is, is being taken away and, and, and being forced in certain directions and they're gonna miss some of those cues. And if you're somebody who's just learning to make those cues or make those emotional bids, don't get so offended if they're not, if you're not getting that in return. And think about this, right? Most of us have never even heard of this term emotional bid. Yeah. Um, Ahmed's just learned about this term recently and he's trying to put himself out there more and I get it, it's difficult when you're being vulnerable, you're laying yourself out there and you're not getting a positive response. I like to take a step back and go, have I been responding to the other person's emotional bids? So instead of starting from a place of, why aren't they responding to my emotional bids? I turn it around to myself and say, can I do a better job of responding to this person's vulnerability and great. these opportunities that they're presenting to me? And when you put the focus outward on how can I respond to more emotional bids instead of inward, which is what am I doing wrong? Why does this person not like me? You're in a much better place personally, emotionally, and ultimately you're going to reach the connection faster. So I have a deep uh, understanding of this. So um, uh, again, I talked about this a little while ago, but I, if I'm to break down, and I'm not using this as any kind of excuse, but if I'm to look and study at my background, I probably didn't, I was probably neglected on some parts of love in my life growing up. And what that has led over a long period of time is neediness. Right. And you have to distinguish whether your emotional bid is clear and concise and is genuine, or are you being needy? Right. Because people turn away from the neediness. Uh, it, as much as it sucks, my wife turns away, and I know that you know if your wife turns or your spouse turns away from enough emotional bids, at least a divorce, but she turns away from a lot of my emotional bids. And I all and and studying this concept, I said, why is that? Oh, she turns away from the needy emotional bids. Right. She embraces the genuine and authentic emotional bids. That's something I have to work on personally. So it's not just. You know, am I listening? Am I, is that person? But I think you have to figure out, are you being needy? Or are you being authentic? And once again, I mean, a lot of people will ask, well, then what is the telltale sign of a, a needy emotional bit? And I think it's always going to be, what is the intent of it? Were you just looking for 100%. attention or were yes. you actually looking to engage totally. with that person? Yeah. And with this, I like to cut people some slack. And I feel like it's too early to write someone off if they didn't respond to your emotional bid or they responded negatively. I, I look at the totality of a few interactions before I start saying, okay, I'm gonna put this person in the acquaintance box or I'm gonna put this person in the friend box. Because we are all in different places at any given time. And there have been conversations where my friends have been trying to be vulnerable and I'm thinking about, this impending deadline that I have with the company or I got to get this video shot and I'm not always present. So giving benefit of the doubt to the people that you are engaging with, even if you're putting yourself out there and being vulnerable and you're not seeing the reciprocity yet is a much better place than being the cynic who just writes everyone off. And that's what we want to stare. That's what we want to stay away from. Now, here's another follow up on vulnerability. We got a question on Instagram. Do you need to build some type of prior relation in order to open up to someone? And I think this is a misconception with vulnerability because when people hear vulnerability, they think like, oh my God, I have to go into my closet of secrets <laughs> and I have to talk about being abused at three years old right. or I have to talk about my alcoholic mom. That's not what we're talking about when we're meeting someone for the first time. 
So there is a grade to the levels of rapport that we're talking about here. There's light, medium, and heavy rapport. And sometimes when we think about vulnerability, we, we race to the heavy rapport. We think about all of the baggage and all of this stuff that are our secrets. And that's not really the vulnerability that we're talking about here. We're talking about the realism, right? Of calling things like you see them, being a little more honest about your opinions instead of the double speak, the corporate speak and holding yourself back. Johnny, you're smiling here on the levels of rapport. Well, it's, you know, I, I tend to be, at least a, a bits in my life, kind of an extreme person when it comes to certain things. So if you tell me, you have to go left and it's going to go way left. You have to go right. It's going to be way right. If you're going to listen to this music, it's going to be way over here. And so I used to get caught up in this all the time. And we're, when, when you and just like you said, when hearing the idea of being vulnerable, it's like, well, I need to really just open up myself and throw it all there and hope it goes well. No, no, no. Because as you said, with light, medium, and heavy disclosure, there's amounts of risk that will allow you to build up to being extremely vulnerable but also like, i could share a story about being at lunch shaking my chocolate milk uh in that moment realizing that i'd already opened it earlier now this is a story that happened in fourth grade but the the emotional bids are there of of surprise humiliation embarrassment we've all experienced them so we can all connect to those, but yet I'm not really putting out anything that can be, uh, I could be man manipulated or used against me. Yeah, isn't it really vulnerability just comes down to presence? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't mean like, you know, you like announce all your failings. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's just being present. And a little more honest. Yeah, I think, I think if, you're if you're willing to listen to other people, and, and, and just feel that presence of listening to them, that's vulnerability, man. Yeah, when everyone else is in their head and you're present and giving that person an opportunity to be vulnerable mm -hmm. with you too, right? Sometimes, and I, I feel like this is where, where we're getting to, right? If we open the floodgates of vulnerability, the other person hearing that is like, <laughs> I'm not ready for this. I don't <laughs> want to get vulnerable with you. Right. It actually works against you. So understanding that vulnerability Johnny's example is something in his distant past, no one's gonna hold his milkshake against him. It's something that happened in the fourth grade. There are simple things in your life right now that are little mistakes, little foibles that you know have frustrated you, and just being honest about that frustration is, is actually that light disclosure that we're talking about. Well, when you're spending so much time on social media, checking everything and triple checking that you don't post anything that's going to get backlash, that creeps into your normal working life of just being around other people where you're checking yourself. You don't want to say something like that. And everyone's just seeing everyone is just sort of shutting themselves off. And then of course we have, we have these issues. Well, I mean, in this PC world <laughs> where everyone is on edge about being called out or what they're going to say, a lot of times the most bodacious, braggadocious, fiercest, I'm just going to be real to the extreme stands out. So we kind of yes. see these two dichotomies. Oh, we see, sure, I put one foot out there and I get completely demolished or I just have to go to the extreme mm -hmm. and just be a complete bragger and bully. And that's how I stand and out. And by the way, you impress 10% of the people and you can make a good living or you can have a lot of 10% <laughs> of friends, but, right. but you know, so, yeah, I, I mean, for me, I just made, I, here I am a digital marketer. And I just pretty much made the decision a few months ago, like I'm minimizing my presence. Because if I'm on it all day long, I'm not giving my full presence to my five-year-old girl. Yeah, I'm not giving my full presence to my wife. And those are the people that I'm trying to, you know, obviously have the strongest relationships in my life. And so uh, this summer, my wife and my little girl and I went, went to Europe for three weeks. We didn't post a picture. Because we didn't want people, I mean, my wife's like, I don't want everybody, you know, whether it's judging or whatever, right. but there's this whole world of people who are just like, well, you know, what is this? What is that? You know, all that stuff. Now I'm still going to post. I have to, like, this is what I do, but I have to minimize it because I need to be emotionally there for other people. And that saps so much of my energy. Well, it's funny. I, th I think we're seeing some, some older people who are getting used to posting 
certain things. They're are, doing it more than the younger people are, right? Well, I knew that I, I was having a hard time. I'm just getting comfortable with Instagram. So, <laughs> but then you look at the younger kids who their whole lives are lived online. And for, I think people see that that's terrifying. Yeah. And then the, the younger generation going out, how did, how do you feel so weird about it? It's just, it's what I grew up with. Yeah. It's very bizarre. Now, when it comes to vulnerability in, in politics, it does feel like candidates tend to be more buttoned up and err on the side of caution with vulnerability. Did you have any guidelines when you worked on campaigns about, hey, this is too much vulnerability, you might want to dial this back? <laughs> <I'm> or... <laughs> never, <laughs> no. Because the way that we came up through politics was the way the generation before them came up, right? They're the ones that we modeled and learned from. Right. And that was the people that grew up in the 50s and 60s and 70s, right? And as I got into politics in the late 90s, that's who taught us. And we were like, uh, you, know, you never give any vulnerability. Now we're starting to see those successful ones do say, you know, and do talk and, and are vulnerable in certain aspects. You can't do too much of it because you're right. You have a high status person, too much vulnerability and they lose their status, right? So right. you have to be cognizant of that. But I'll give you a good example of where this works. So I worked for, a, there's a US Senator from South Dakota. I lived in South Dakota for a year and worked for this guy, John Thune. John Thune was a congressman, he's been a US Senator, he's in leadership in the United States Senate right now. And if he goes home, everybody calls him John. And that's what he wants. You don't call him, there's no title. Or right. it, I'm the, you must call me the Senator. Senator. <laughs> like, but that's how the other 99 do. Yeah, of course. He doesn't, everybody calls him John. And in like, if people come up to him and say, hey, Senator, at home, he's like, ah, just call me John. Like, to me, that's a vulnerability. It's like, you don't, you don't have to do that. I'm a normal person. I have kids, I have a family. Yeah. And, and he's like the one guy in politics I've ever worked for that literally is the same person he was when the time I met him, which was 16 years ago. So that's impressive. Yeah. But I mean, that to me is vulnerability, right? right. That's why I kind of like him. He keeps that humbleness about him. And I think that that's what we encourage some of these politicians to do is to show that humbleness and through that you get vulnerability. And people, actually resonate with that, right? The buttoned up candidate, the candidate who doesn't make any mistakes, right. who always has the sound bite, who sticks to the script. Everyone is leery of them. And it's getting worse for that candidate, as can, we've seen. People read it from a mile away. Yeah. It's kind of like the ESPN thing we talked about earlier. No one's dumb. Like no one, no one's, everybody sees that. So, why, so don't speak to me like I'm an idiot. All the gobbledygook of these like very generic statements that companies put out now, right? Like I, I, I use well, the, I use this in the book. Like if you're a company and you get a bad Yelp review, pick up the phone and call or, or respond and say, can I call you and talk to you? Yeah. Like don't just put out uh, recently someone gave us a generic, we have tried really sincerely hard to run this business. No one's paying attention to that. And everybody sees this gobbledygook. So stop that. Stop it. That's what I say. Like it's stop the gobbledygook. God, gobbledygook. it just pisses me off. This vulnerability and neediness is is coming up a couple times here in a question. Shane asks, lots of times an uncalibrated biff for vulnerability can come across as needy or approval seeking. For some people, even used as a mean of gaining control of the conversation. What's a good way to frame the vulnerability without seeming needy or approval seeking? And what is a good way to spot the needy behaviors in others so that we can just screen them out? <laughs> so let's unpack this. There's a few There's layers. There's a here. lot going on. The first layer that he's talking about is obviously no one wants to come across as needy or approval seeking. We've, we've talked about that, right? That is a complete turnoff. But it comes down to intent, as Johnny was saying here. If your intention is to win their attention, their approval, and their acceptance in the words that you're calibrating in the expression of the vulnerability, then yes, you're doing just that. You're needy and approval seeking. But if you're being vulnerable to just share who you are, regardless of the consequence, without, regardless of the gaming out and strategizing, right? We're getting so internal and meta, it's just, this is how I'm feeling. This is what happened. This is the truth. This is what everyone saw with their own eyes, right? Whether it's corporate speak or whether it's a personal mistake, that's the ownership that we're talking about in vulnerability. Now, the oversharing for me is a turnoff when it's every single time I talk to that person, right? 
again, if, if someone's vulnerable once or twice or they share something, I'm like, oh, okay, well, you know, he wanted to get that point across. But every single time you interact with them and Johnny's laughing because he knows these, these victims, it's in their social media posts, it's in their conversation, it's just dripping with this victim mentality. Well, then of course you're losing the plot. You're losing people's interest. But AJ, aren't we a society of victims now? It feels like it. Yeah. It feels like everyone has banded together as their own subgroup of victims. And it's it's hard to get out of that mindset if you can't do it noodling around on social media. Well, there's a, stuck to, you a solidarity out. to the victimization, yeah. right? It's like when you come out and say, I'm a victim of this, and then five other people say, I too, then you feel like you've tapped into this community. And, and what social has allowed us is to find more yeah, of those yeah, like-minded victims, which are needles and haystacks normally. Right, and in it doesn't LA, advance you forward. It sta- keeps you back in right. that victimhood. It doesn't allow you to actually change anything. You've ceded all control of the problem and the issue to the universe. Well, yeah, because <laughs> the the result would either have to be, oh, I need to go to the gym today, or I could talk to this guy. He doesn't go to the gym either, and he feels like crap too. Right. <laughs> So, and, and it's much easier to talk to this guy than it is to go to the gym. When we talk about screening people out, I, I like to think about how did that, at, at the end of the interaction, at the end of multitudes of interactions, how did that person make me feel? Did that person make me feel like I should be charging them for my time because they just want to sit on the couch and complain and they just need my emotional support every time I talk to them? Or do I feel like there's genuine engagement sure. with me and my problems and there's support going both ways. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll give a good example. Um, so I, I'm, I, I take a lot of action and if I'm confused or I need help. So one of the people that I mentored and I reached out to is Tucker Max. Yeah. And Tucker's become, uh, become a friend of mine. But you know, Tucker will tell you the truth no matter how hard it hurts. But when I'm stuck, I call him like, hey, what do you think of this? And he just lays it out and then I get to work. And I think he is cool with our friendship because I take action. Yeah. I don't mire in it, you know, but you know, it's not easy. I have to be able to take his raw truth, which goes very, very strong at me sometimes. But, but let's be honest, very few people are willing to give you that. Totally. So it's important that you actually make space for that in your life and have those people who can share on that level. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Philip. We had great conversation here about the book. Check it out. Fire them now. The seven lies digital marketers sell to business owners, politicians. And not only that, we learned a lot about your personal life. Thank you for opening up and sharing some of that vulnerability with our listeners. Yes. Yeah, and um, if any business owner is just totally like wiped out, doesn't understand what's going on, we created through the book, but uh, a free digital media audit they can go and fill out for three minutes. They can go fill out all their publicly uh, digital footprint and my team will literally assess everything they do, put together a report and do a free consultation call to kind of get them moving forward. And we've typically seen businesses go like uh, improve their ROI by about 50% just in the two or three things they can do to improve. And where would I find that? Yeah, philipstutz.com backslash audit. Thank you so much. Right on. 